Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast episode of Andy's Witchcraft. I hope you are all having a wonderful day so far, um, that you had a blessed lunasa and spent it doing whatever it was that you do to practice some self-care and manifestations. Today's episode, we are going to discuss lunar magic. Um, the importance of the phases of the moon, some biblical aspects on moons and moon magic, Buddhist aspects and the moon and moon magic, and then going into detail on the specific um, qualities and characteristics of the different moon phases. So let's get started. The First, like to start off, um, I'm going into like a general overview on lunar magic. And so traditionally, the moon represents feminine energy and the cyclical nature of life. The moon is known to be connected to intuition, change, fluidity, reflection, and is related to the water element. Even though in general and the majority of cultures believe that the moon represents a feminine energy, some cultures associate the moon with a masculine energy. These cultures um, include Inuit, Norse, uh, Ibibio, Efik Ibibio, and uh, Luia. Um, so typically they are like more like close practices-ish, except Norse, Norse from what I understand is not close practice. But a lot of these traditions that consider the moon to be a masculine energy are closed cultures and traditions. Um, some cultures, um, especially in the eastern part of the world, um, follow the lunar calendar and they celebrate the lunar new year. Uh, for example, Buddhist traditions typically follow this lunar calendar and their holidays um, are uh, planned and uh, associated with different dif dif different um, lunar phases and depending on when the next lunar phase shows up. Um, for example, in Buddhist traditions, they have a week long celebration to welcome a new lunar cycle and new beginnings. So when we have the new moon, that's, you know, when they have the celebration to welcome the next lunar cycle. Um, and following this lunar cycle um, can help us feel like we're in better alignment with the natural world as well as with our own intuition and inner tides. Lunar cycles were used as a guides for planting, harvesting, celebrations, and fertility. Um, and they still are to this day, although less common. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, much about astronomy, um, it is the movement of the moon orbiting around the earth that makes the moon appear as if it is increasing or decreasing in the sky. These changes are what we know as the phases of the moon. Uh, it's not that the moon is literally changing shape, but it's the amount of sunlight that is reflecting on the moon and that we can see from earth. Uh, the lunar cycle, although not um, the most empirical proof of this, but it has been shown to impact animal behaviors, especially related to hunting um, in the increasing moonlight. Um, so, for example, um, although the, um, the lunar hysteria, um, the fact that more chaos is in the world during a full moon, that's more of a myth. But in the animal kingdom, this is more factual basis of changes in animal behaviors based on the lunar cycle. So for example, wolves are known to be more active during the full moon, not because of werewolves or anything like that, but because they can see their prey more um, in the increased moonlight. And this causes them to communicate with their fellow wolves more often and more loudly. Another example is the vampire bat. They reduce their activity during the waxing or full moon phase because they have many nocturnal predators who see them more in the moonlight. Um, and another interesting fact that I recently discovered is that fishermen follow the lunar cycle. They plan their fishing trips based on the phases of the moon um, because they found that the best fishing takes place in the four days preceding the full moon, so a waxing moon, and the four days after the new or the dark moon, um, which is the phase when the moon is not visible. 
the most common theories as to why these phases are peak for fishing times um, may have to do with the moon's effect on tides and currents. So a big reason why the moon is associated with the water element is because it has been known, its gravitational pull has been known to um, impact our waves and tides um, and yeah. Uh, and finally, dogs and cats are in animal emergency wards more often when the moon is waxing or full because, again, they can see better. So they tend to get into more mischief. Um, and on top of that, we can see them better. Uh, we're more likely to see where animals are at night. So there's that natural world basis for lunar cycles impacting behavior. Now we'll go on to like the more magical side. So moon magic is a belief that working rituals at the time of different phases of the moon can bring about physical or psychological change or transformation. Ancient civilizations like the Egyptians, Native Americans, Greeks, Hebrews, and Chinese all recognized the moon's prominence and power in the night sky. And again, they still do in this modern age. Some cultures believe that the moon was symbolic of the triple moon goddess, um, representing the three incarnations of female identity, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. So this is one big reason why the moon is associated with feminine energy in most cultures. It's because they relate it to the female identity. Some witches and pagans even create a moon altar and they change their altar up depending on the phase of the moon going, going on. Um, and when these individuals add a moon symbol of some type, of some type on their altar, um, it's not necessarily because they are worshiping the moon. And th them having a lunar altar has nothing to do with worshiping the moon, although it could, depending on your beliefs. But they're just utilizing the moon's energy for an extra oomph <laughs> to boost um, their spells, project their thoughts, desires, and manifestations, and even prayers out into the universe. So their request is enhanced or magnified based on the power of the moon. The four basic lunar phases um, that are essential to know to understand this podcast episode, um, although these can be divided into sub- phases uh, we're going to go into like the four overarching basic phases which would be the new moon the waxing moon the full moon and the waning moon um but again like i said we can break them down further and when you break it down further it typically is broken down into new moon waxing crescent first quarter waxing gibbous full moon waning gibbous last quarter and waning crescent moon so again, for the purposes of this podcast, and because this is the knowledge that I have based on my research and the books I've read, um, we'll focus on the basic phases of the moon. So now that that is out of the way, um, I will now discuss some Bible verses that talk about the moon and the importance of following the moon and its cycles. So the first one comes from Psalm chapter 8 verses 3 through 4 when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have set in place what is mankind that you are mindful to them human beings that you care for them the next verse um, is Genesis chapter 37 verse 9 then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers listen he said I had another dream and this time the Sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. The next verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differ from, differs from star in splendor. Then we have Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 35. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Then I have 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verses 30 through 31. They were also to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. They were to do the same in the evening, and whenever burnt offerings were presented to the Lord on the Sabbaths, 
at the new moon feasts and at the appointed festivals. They were to serve before the Lord regularly in the proper number and in the way prescribed for them. Next is Isaiah chapter 66 verses 22 through 23. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. Then I have Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10. Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, majestic as the stars in procession? The second last verse is Proverbs, chapter 7, verse 20. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. Finally, we have Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 11. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. And of course, there are way more verses than this, but these are kind of like my top verses because uh, most of these verses refer to the moon's divine or God-given beauty or to the importance of following the moon phases for traveling purposes or spiritual purposes. Um, and for generations, the moon was seen as a divine feminine gift from God and its cycle has been followed to track the days, weeks, months, and years. So obviously, if the moon was mentioned and the words full moon and new moon were mentioned to specify the type of moon in there, it was clearly very important for that time and it should still be important today. Now I'm going to talk more about Buddhism and the moon. So like I said before, Buddhists follow the lunar cycle, um, for the lunar calendar as well. Um, and so the lunar cycles are very important in their culture. And I will talk a little bit about why. So according to Buddhists, the phases of the moon represent the path of death and birth, the repetitive cycle of reaching fullness, and then of beginning over again. Since reincarnation is a strong belief in Buddhism, the moon cycle becomes a friendly reminder of those beliefs. So similar to astrological perspectives, Buddhists also believe that the moon has a strong effect on our human body and behavior. The most celebrated phase of the moon in Buddhist cultures is the full moon. Um, and traditionally, it is taught that on a full moon, we should take more time to relax. The reason that there's specific significance on the full moon is because important events connected with the life of the Buddha took place on full moon days. The Buddha was born on a full moon day, his renunciation, so the day he gave up secular living to le lead a holy life, also took place on a full moon day, his enlightenment, uh, delivery of his first sermon, his passing away into Nibbana occurred on full moon days. So with this pattern, they were like, okay, the full moon is clearly significant and we should hold it to a sort of holy, a spiritual standard in our culture. So historically, it was the full moon and new moon days that were declared public holidays in many Buddhist countries, and people were encouraged to devote their time to spiritual development at these times. So many Buddhists observed the eight precepts on full moon days. They free themselves of family commitments and keep away from worldly pleasures to have peace of mind for their spiritual development. Um, and to balance out the intensity of the full moon because it's known to impact our behavior to such an extent, uh, they engage in activities that calm the spirit rather than activating it. So meditation, grounding exercises, uh, muscle relaxation techniques, um, etc. Um, in most Buddhist lineages, it is common to perform a special meditation ceremony on the full moon day. And this ceremony includes a chant before sitting in silence and is followed by a candlelight procession where the Buddha is honored. So what I love about my spiritual practice as a crystal pagan Buddhist is the fact that, well, whereas a lot of people think that 
my spiritual practices contradict one another they really don't they work in harmonious ways they just have a different way of explaining it different um, myths and ways of getting about it but they all work in harmony and they all lead to the same outcome and so I can find balance in it and it's not a sin and it's not a crime so <laughs> So now for the final section of this video, I will be discussing the phases of the moon, um, some crystals you can use uh, for each phase, uh, and what kind of spell work or manifestations you can do for each phase. Um, and of course, you can mix and match, you know, you don't have to stick to like this phase is good for like protection spells, let's say. Um, you can do protection spells on any phase, but it's just um, if you want the most lunar energy for this particular intention try to coordinate it with the associated phase so the first phase is the new moon and this is the beginning of the lunar cycle uh, this is when the moon appears to have vanished because it is completely dark in the sky the new moon occurs when the sun and moon are exactly lined up from our perspective on earth so it'll go like sun moon and then earth in one straight line basically uh, magically speaking the new moon energy lasts for about three days so if you can't do um anything for the new moon on the actual day don't worry about it because you have up to three days to um, take advantage of its magical energy. Crystals you can use for the new moon are black tourmaline and black obsidian. They're both great for grounding, protection, and confidence in your intentions. And this is truly important because the new moon, this is when you're starting to plan your manifestations, plan your goals, and you want to protect those intentions from any negative entities that are going to mess it up. Um, and so protection is truly important, especially during the beginning of a new journey, a new phase. So I highly recommend those crystals. Next is Labradorite. This is a supportive stone during times of change. As this is the beginning of a new lunar cycle, this is something new. There will be change compared to the previous lunar cycle. And so you want a stone that will help you adjust to said change. And Labradorite is that. Next we have Lapis Lazuli. This helps us see into our divine truth and where we need to grow. So if you can't decide on your own what you want to manifest, what you want to work towards, what goals you want, uh, Lapis Lazuli is great to assist you with that and come into the truth on what you really need in life, not just what you want in life. Finally, we have Smoky Quartz. This transforms negative energy into something positive, which is great for if you want to start fresh. You take all the negative energy of the previous cycle, if you had any, and you can start fresh, you can start positive. So Smoky Quartz is great for that. So what can you do for the new moon? The first thing is internal reflection. So you should look into yourself and find out what it is you really want and need in life. Um, and this is great because it'll help you, again, um, start a new beginning, uh, a new journey towards what it is you want. Um, and the new moon is a great phase for new beginnings. So you want to think, how can I start fresh? How can I start on this new journey? Um, there are a few more common witchy things you can do, like refreshing wards, spell jars, altars, cleanse your space. Uh, do bath magic for physically cleansing and spiritual cleansing to start fresh um, and truly prepare to protect for your uh, journey. So new moons are great uh, to do rituals for setting intentions and manifesting what it is you desire for your future. Not only the far future, but the near future during this next cycle. Um, so... The new moon is a great time to write your intention on a bay leaf and burn it to release it into the universe and send it to your deities if that's what you believe in. And some of the best spells that you can try during the new moon are good luck spells and, like I said before, protection spells. The next lunar phase is the waxing moon. 
This is the period when the moon appears to be growing larger and larger in the sky. Um, this phase lasts for about two weeks, which is the entire period between the new moon and the full moon. Crystals that you can use during the waxing moon are green adventuring for prosperity and growth, green opal for strength to push forward and rebuild, which is truly important um, as the waxing moon is the start of physically taking action to get what, whatever you wanted during the new moon. So you want to push forward and rebuild during this new cycle, this new start and new journey. Jade is great for gentleness, serenity, and balance. So sometimes we are hard on ourselves and we think if we don't get what we want or if we don't get what we need, we're hard on ourselves. We may self-blame, we may doubt. And Jade is just a great stone to help cope with that. It's great for being gentle with yourself, for finding inner peace, for balancing your mind, body, and spirit. Um, and so the waxing moon, when the most change is happening, when the call for action is, uh, jade is just a great stone to help you find mindfulness. Tiger's eye is great for motivation and inner strength to take action rather than sitting in fear. So like I said, the waxing moon, you want to take action, you want to motivate yourself, and tiger's eye is the crystal for you. Finally, howlite. Again, we're talking about the importance of mindful awareness, clarity to express what you are feeling. Um, and so how light is great for that. Um, and it's just going to help you throughout your journey of manifesting what it is you desire. So what can you do during the waxing phase? The first suggestion is again, take action. So whatever you made plans for during the new moon, this is the time to actively um, take action <laughs> to reach those goals. So for example, if you set your intention during the new moon to learn more about your ancestors, you know, you're not going to learn about your ancestors by just sitting around. You have to do research and find out about your background. And so the waxing moon is great to do those things so that you can get to your end goal. The waxing moon is also a good time for abundance magic. So just magic in general, that's for prosperity and growth. So spells you, that you can do during this time are money spells, career spells, and good luck spells. The next phase is the full moon. This is the culmination of the moon cycle. So like, let's say you're on a roller coaster. This is kind of like the tip top of the roller coaster before you start going down again. Uh, the cycle occurs when the sun and moon are exactly aligned opposite one another from our perspective here on Earth. Um, and it happens at a very precise moment. However, its magical energy, similar to the new moon, lasts for about three days. The full moon has a different name every month, um, and each one has different spiritual properties. Um, different civilizations label the full moons according to their experiences and traditions and what they meant to them and their ancestors. The names were also a means to track or record time and seasons of the year. So now I'm going to list the names commonly used to describe the full moon of each month of the year. And you can look up the associations online during your own time. Um, but I figured this episode... We're going to go with like the basics um, and maybe when the next of the full moons come up, I'll do an episode talking about that. But so the first full moon is in January. This is the wolf moon. Then in February, we have the snow moon. In March, we have the worm moon. April, we have the pink moon. May, we have the flower moon. June, we have the strawberry moon. July, we have the Buck Moon. August, we have the Sturgeon Moon. September, we have the Harvest Moon. October, we have the Hunter's Moon. November, we have the Beaver Moon. And December, we have the Cold Moon. Now, like I said, generally we have one full moon each month. However, because each year the moon completes its final cycle 11 days before the earth finishes its orbit around the sun, every two to three years, there is an extra full moon. Um, and this could be, you know, two full moons in a month, typically. Um, 
and uh, sometimes it'll lead to having like four full moons in one season but yeah this full moon is called the blue moon and actually uh, this year we are having a blue moon at the end of this month August um, the exact date of the blue moon um, is August 30th, I think. Yes, so it's August 30th to 31st of this year is our blue moon. Um, and so yeah, do something fun to celebrate because it's going to be an interesting one. Crystals that you can use during the full moon are Moonstone to connect to intuition and higher guidance. Clear Quartz to amplify uh, and increase your energy and balance what is needed. Rose Quartz um, because during the full moon it's important to practice self-care um, and it's just a great crystal to show yourself that self-love and foster empathy and self-forgiveness. You could also use selenite to call in calm and tranquility, as well as intuition and perception, and amethyst to open up psychic abilities and connect to your higher self. So as the end of the moon cycle is approaching, um, you want to um, see how you grew since the beginning of the lunar cycle and connect to that higher self. So what can you do during the full moon? Like I said, you can look up the general associations for each individual full moon, depending on which one you're celebrating. However, in general, full moons are great for rituals for healing, love, gratitude, um, <clears throat> spicy magic, uh, and self-care. So if you want to uh, improve your relationship with yourself or with your friends or with a romantic or sexual partner, um, the full moon is a great time to do that. The full moon is also a great time to celebrate your progress, again, since the beginning of your of the lunar cycle. So you want to acknowledge your achievements, whether they're big, like starting a new career, or small, like getting out of bed in the morning. It's also a good time to manifest, so bay leaf rituals can work here as well. And the full moon is an extremely potent for, a form of energy to charge your crystals with. Finally, we have the waning moon. So this is the period when the moon appears to be growing smaller and smaller in the sky. Similar to the waxing moon, this lasts about two weeks from the entire period between the full moon and the new moon. Crystals that you can use during this time are lepidolite to eliminate stress and anxiety, uh, scolocyte to bring a sense of peace and ease of suffering, unikite, unikite, uh, which is good for overcoming loss and grief. Rhodonite for releasing blocked fear and restoring faith. And fluorite to improve focus and block stress. So all of these crystals have the same overarching theme, which is just to relax, um, de-stress, and um, overcome negative strong negative emotions. Um, and the reason for this, I believe, is the new moon, like I said, especially in like Buddhist cultures, um, yeah, the, both the full and the new moon um, in general are moments a time when it's important to relax and meditate on your journey. And so the waning moon helps you prepare for that. So you want crystals that will help you prepare by starting to gradually reduce the stress of the previous cycle. So what can you do during this waning phase? Number one, you can release and let go of what no longer serves you. These can be ideas, behaviors, people, relationships, etc. So, for example, cord cutting rituals work really well during this time. Um, next would be protection magic, as well as banishing spells, where you banish whatever unwanted entities are in your space. Protect yourself from what no longer benefits you. You could also do cleansing rituals to remove anything that no longer serves you. And again, prepare to start fresh during the new moon. Um, you could also do a return to sender karmic justice spells. Again, you're, re you're, making, you're making all that negative energy form a U-turn away from you. And then finally, you could do gratitude spells because as you're at the end of the cycle, you're at the end of another journey and you want to think back to what you are grateful for and what achievements you have 
accomplished. So that is the end of this episode. Thank you all for listening um, and tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, a comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more. Um, If you want more updates, you can follow me on social media. I'm starting to make posts, kind of making a general recap on my episodes. So if you want kind of like Canva Uh, Instagram posts that look pretty and have like general brief notes of this episode you can um, follow me there at Andy's Witchcraft you can follow me on TikTok for more like fun video posts Um, that is um, at Sacred Moon Divination and I actually have a Tumblr now which is also at Sacred Moon Divination so go ahead and follow me on those Um, i also have the link of my link tree below which has all my social media but it also has my booking for any divination readings if you guys are interested in booking with me and um, supporting my small business i would greatly appreciate that Um, and you can also use that to uh, if you click on the form video ideas you can make a video suggestion i would also appreciate that because you know it's it's always good to have an abundance of ideas and i would like to hear what you guys want to hear um and then finally i have a discord server called the crystal caverns that link will also be in the link tree below so that is everything for today i hope you all enjoyed this um Blessed be everyone. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.